Over the course of the last 2,000 years, the church built around the name of the Son of the Most High Elohim has endured many evolutionary and revolutionary periods of time. Many are already aware of the promises that our Messiah made regarding the outcome for those that would truly follow the way He laid out for us, that we would be hated, persecuted, mocked, ridiculed, and even killed, just as He was. It was no surprise then that those apostles and disciples that closely follow the way prescribed for them by the Messiah Himself did in fact endure trials of all kinds, torture, stoning, beheading, and even crucifixion, all on account of following the way. Many are also already aware of the mass murder of the early followers of Messiah Yeshua that occurred in the period just after His ascension, namely, persecution by the Romans, in which followers of Messiah were fed to the beasts, beheaded, burned at the stake, and even worse. According to many historians, there were at least 10 great persecutions that took place against the followers of Messiah, to include the famous extermination attempts made by the Roman Emperor Nero in 64 and 65 AD, the attacks by the Emperor Domitian, the major persecution under the hand of Marcus Aurelius in 177 AD, and many others. In fact, the mass murder of those who followed the true way of the Messiah continued at least until 313 CE, when the Emperor Constantine finally terminated persecutions with the Edict of Milan, which granted toleration of the early church. But when looking at the early church, the original followers of the way of Messiah, and seeing how intensely they were hated by the Romans, who even tried to kill the Messiah himself before he was born under the Roman-appointed King Herod, we are left with a profound question that many have failed to truly answer. If the Romans hated Yeshua and his followers from the very beginning, and even spent nearly 300 years trying to exterminate them from the face of the earth, how could the first early church fathers be Roman themselves? If the Roman church is considered by many today to be the earliest Christian church, why were they killing the followers of Messiah in the first place, and what changed? Today, let us investigate and truly attempt to reveal not only why these historic persecutions took place, but perhaps even more importantly, the true name of who was being persecuted in those days. You might just find that there's a prophetic significance to knowing the true name of the first followers of the way, as they were called when the Ecclesia was founded, and how prophecy reveals what they will be called in the time of the end, the Nazarim. How did the early followers of Messiah go from being outcast, accused of heresy, and even killed for over 300 years, to being supposedly accepted by the Romans after the Edict of Milan? Was there a dramatic shift in Roman theology during this time? Or was there a dramatic shift in what it meant to be considered a follower of the way, according to Christian customs? Which do you think is more likely? The first Christians, as described in the first chapters of the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible, were all Jews either by birth or conversion, and historians refer to them as Jewish Christians. Additionally, the early gospel message was spread orally and in the Aramaic language. Although the use of Greek was used almost immediately within the first decades of the spread of the Good News, this historic account explains why Paul stated in Romans 1.16 that, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of Yah unto salvation to everyone that believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. You see, the Jews were to be the first to receive the gospel message of the Messiah, as Yeshua specifically targeted both the house of Judah and the house of Israel with his ministry before anyone else. In Matthew 10, verse 5 through 7, Yeshua says, These twelve Yahusha sent forth, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, 
the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And also in Matthew 15, 24, Yahusha told his disciples, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So it should come as no surprise that the first followers of the way of Messiah were in fact from the Jewish faith, or were, at the very least, associated with one of the lost tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. It should also come as no surprise that the first written gospel account of the book of Matthew was written in Aramaic Hebrew, and not Greek, as we will see in just a minute. However, it must be clearly noted that the early Christian writers and philosophers from Greek and Roman origins were very well aware of the fact that those followers of the way were of a Hebrew Abrahamic mindset, holding fast to the scriptures that they were raised with, just as they were instructed by the letters of the disciples, such as 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Yeshua Messiah. All scripture is given by inspiration of Yah, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Yah may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It must be noted here that when this statement was written, the only holy scriptures that the early church apostles could have possibly referred to are the scriptures of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, which Paul tells us plainly are profitable for doctrine and for instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness? Perhaps this is the same biblically defined righteousness spoken of by the Apostle John when he said, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. On top of all this, these first followers never referred to themselves as Christians at all, but by another name that we will closely examine today that holds deeply prophetic roots. Many of you may recall that Acts 11.26 tells us, The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. However, what you may not know is that Antioch is considered to be the site of the first Gentile church by Christian history, as it was an ancient Greek city ruled by the Roman Republic as early as 64 BC. It was the Greeks and Romans who called these non-Hebrew followers Christians in Antioch. But still, that is not what the first followers, including the apostles and their followers, called themselves. In fact, some historians point to the likelihood that it was Ignatius that coined this term of Christian, as he was establishing his own authority as bishop in Antioch during that same time. But the original followers were known in history and in scripture as the Nazarene, often poorly translated as Nazarenes by future scribes and historians. Today we'll discover why this name is so remarkably prophetic and even prove that this name points to the awakened remnant of the end times. But before we do, let's take a look at what some of the early church writers had to say about the Nazarene, the first followers of the way of Messiah. But these sectarians did not call themselves Christians, but Nazarenes. However, they are simply complete Jews. They use not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well as the Jews do. They have no different ideas, but confess everything exactly as the law proclaims it, and in the Jewish fashion, except for their belief in the Messiah, if you please. For they acknowledge both the resurrection of the dead and the divine creation of all things, and declare that God is one, and that his son is Yeshua the Messiah. They are trained to a nicety in Hebrew, for among them the entire law, the prophets, and the writings are read in Hebrew as they surely are by the Jews. They are different from the Jews and different from the Christians, only in the following. They disagree with Jews because they have come to faith in Messiah. But since they are still fettered by the law, circumcision, the Sabbath, and the rest, they are not in accord with Christians. They are nothing but Jews. They have the good news according to Matthew in its entirety in Hebrew. 
for it is clear that they still preserve this in the Hebrew alphabet as it was originally written. They are characterized essentially by their tenacious attachment to Jewish observances. If they became heretics in the eyes of the Mother Church, it is simply because they remain fixed on outmoded positions. They well represent, though Epiphanius is energetically refusing to admit it, the very direct descendants of that primitive community, of which our author knows that it was designated by the Jews, by the same name, of Nazarenes. The Nazarenes do not differ in any essential thing from them, since they practice the customs and doctrines prescribed by the Jewish law, except that they believe in Christ. They believe in the resurrection of the dead and that the universe was created by God. They preach that God is one and that Jesus Christ is his son. They are very learned in the Hebrew language. They read the law. Therefore, they differ from the true Christians because they fulfill until now Jewish rites such as the circumcision, Sabbath, and others. So we can see from just a few of the sources that the earliest followers of Messiah were still inclined to observe the Sabbath and read the Law of Moses, and were considered nothing more than Jews who also accepted Yeshua as the prophesied Messiah. In fact, as first century expert Marcel Simon admitted, these followers of both the Law and Messiah were considered the very direct descendants of that primitive community. The community mentioned here is the early followers of the way. In fact, when Paul was being accused and condemned in Acts 24, 5, our Bible tells us that he was known as the ringleader in this early community of the Nazarene. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Yahudim throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. Also, while Paul was defending the faith in Rome and speaking to the Jewish leaders, we see again that this sect of the Nazarene was spoken against everywhere. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him to his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of Yah, persuading them concerning Yahusha, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning until evening. Paul never denies that he was one of the ringleaders of this sect. In fact, he reasons with the leaders to justify its existence by using the scriptures. And while we're on the topic of scriptures, it must also be mentioned that although there are no publicly available copies according to historians, the first Gospel of Matthew was written in his native tongue, Hebrew. Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. While Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome and laying the foundation of the church, after their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. And so now we can clearly see that the earliest descendants of our Messiah and his disciples held closely to the Tanakh and even considered the Old Testament to be important for forming doctrine and for instructing the early church in walking in righteousness. Additionally, they even published their first gospel in Hebrew and were accused of being nothing more than Jews by the Greek and Roman philosophers of the earliest years. Just Jews who also accept the Messiah. Perhaps this is why Yahusha told us in Matthew 5.18 that the law will stand as long as heaven and earth exist, when he said, For verily I say unto you, until the heaven and earth pass away, one iota, or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all come to pass. Perhaps this is why Peter, a man who walked with Messiah for years and learned everything he knew from Yahusha himself, was still refusing to eat unclean food many, many years after the Messiah had ascended to heaven. But Peter said, Not so, Adonai, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. 
Perhaps this is why Paul, a man most familiar with the law of Moses, thought it necessary to keep the appointed feasts of the Most High, again, many years after the ascension of the Messiah. Bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if Yahweh will. And he sailed from Ephesus. But let us not get too far off topic, and reserve these discussions for another time, since we know that the late Christian writers would distort the very meanings of Peter's vision, even adding subtext into the very scriptures that are not represented in the original manuscripts. But we must ask the question, how did the Romans and Greeks, who clearly hated the Nazarene and who persecuted and killed the first followers of the way for hundreds of years, become the first official Christian church? Think about that. The Romans killed off thousands who followed the way over a period of at least 300 years. But history reveals that somehow the striving ceased, and suddenly the doctrines of this Jesus Christ were held onto with a very, very tight grip of authority. In fact, teaching or spreading doctrines contrary to what the Roman Church taught concerning Jesus and the New Testament suddenly became hazardous to your health. Up until the time of Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch in the late first century, all matters of doctrinal dispute that arose in Antioch were ultimately referred to the Jerusalem Council, as we see in Acts 14.26-15.2. through 15, However, Ignatius usurped the authority of the Jerusalem Council, declaring himself as the local bishop and ultimately the authority over the assembly in Antioch. Likewise, he declared the same as true for all bishops and their local assemblies. Here are a few quotes from Ignatius' own letters. By exalting the power of the office of bishop and demanding the authority of the bishop over the assembly, Ignatius was already hard at work taking absolute authority over the assembly at Antioch and encouraging other Gentile believers to follow his method. Additionally, Ignatius lured the Christian church, as he first called it, away from the Torah and declared it to be abolished. Be not deceived with strange doctrines, nor with old fables which are unprofitable. For if we still live according to the law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace. For the divinest prophets lived according to Christ Jesus, not the law. On this account also were they persecuted. But if anyone shall preach the Jewish law unto you, hearken not unto him. Ignatius was also hard at work replacing the true seventh-day Sabbath with Sunday worship, writing the following, No longer observing Sabbaths, but keeping the Lord's day in which also our life is sprung up by him and through his death. Having succeeded from the authority of the Jerusalem Council, which was headed by the apostles and their appointed, Ignatius declared the Torah abolished and replaced the Sabbath with Sunday creating a new religion altogether. Ignatius then coined a new term, never before seen in historical literature, when he called his new theological belief system Christianity, and declared that anyone who lives by any other name is not of God. Let us learn to live according to the rules of Christianity, for whosoever is called by any other name besides this, he is not of God. By only the end of the first century, Ignatius of Antioch declared that the Nazarene or Nazarene doctrine of keeping Torah and faith in Messiah was to be considered error and heresy, despite the fact that other theologians admitted in their letters that Paul himself kept the Torah, the Sabbath, and circumcision, which we see also in the New Testament.
Many other writers and theologians heavily influenced the early Christian churches and their understanding of Messiah over several hundred years as we will see. And on February 27th, 380, the Roman Empire would officially adopt the Trinitarian version of Christianity as the state church of the Roman Empire. Think about that and let that sink in. They wouldn't adopt the teachings and follow the way known to the very earliest 12 disciples and their churches. All those were killed and labeled heretics. A new church was emerging, and so were new doctrines. As they continued to be lumped in among the Jews, the Nazarene were hated by literally everyone. The adherents to Judaism hated the Nazarene because of their belief in the Messiah Yeshua. In fact, the Orthodox Jews of that time would appoint a Messiah of their own. In 132 CE, Simon Bar Kokhba was endorsed by the leading Jewish intellectual of that time, Rabbi Akiba, to be the promised Messiah. And in 135 CE, Bar Kokhba led a revolt against Rome. The Nazarene Jews, or the Nazarim, however, refused to join in the revolt as they concluded this would go against their belief in Yeshua as the Messiah. This resulted in bloodshed between Jews on both sides, and by the end of the second century, a wedge was driven between the Nazarene movement and mainstream Judaism. The Bar Kokhba revolt was not the only reason for the separation, however, as more and more Gentiles joined the new Nazarene movement, the Jewish presence in and of itself became progressively less significant. Although Christianity didn't officially take a stance against Judaism until early in the 4th century, divisions and differences of opinion began in the 1st century. As a result of the persistent mission to take the gospel to the Gentiles, the ethnic composition of the Nazarene sect began to rapidly change from a prior Jewish majority to a Gentile majority. For a time, Gentiles remained with the Nazarene, However, by the end of the first century, non-Jewish influences affected the structure and beliefs of the now Gentile-dominated movement. Then, early in the second century, many of the early church fathers, also called the Apostolic Fathers, began to make statements which further separated Gentiles from all Jewish forms. Non-Jewish doctrines began to be developed which became the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith. Although non-Jewish Christians were not particularly opposed to the Jews, and many still converted to a Jewish-based understanding of the scriptures, the formal position of the rising church was decisively set against the synagogue. The rising church system sought to conquer the Jewish faith altogether, which in their own view continued to cling stubbornly to their ancestral practices. Embittered, the church fathers set out to prove that Judaism was legalistic, dead, and a superseded religion. By reversing the biblical image of the Jews and Israel, the church claimed to be the new Israel, called Jacob, whereas the Jews were to be considered Esau and Cain, the murderers of their brother. Israel was portrayed as blind and divorced from the Christian God. This replacement theology stated that the Jews had forfeited what God had given them, and now Christianity was a new heir to the promise and blessings of the Christian God. The Jews, according to them, were destined to keep their curses. Contrast this form of replacement theology, as it was originally created, with a more scripturally accurate understanding that the house of Israel are those who are grafted in from among the formerly Gentile people. The Christian church and its doctrines did not replace Israel, but those of the faith simply are to become a part of it, just as those who were cut off can also be grafted back in as well. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, 
he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted back in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? You will see very shortly why the use of the word branches here in Romans 11 is so significant. But sadly, many within the corridors of the Christian church still hold to this flawed doctrine perpetrated by the early church fathers, that the Christian church has replaced Israel in Yah's timeline, instead of simply becoming grafted into it. Take, for example, the epistle of Barnabas written in approximately 135 CE, where, in referring to the Mosaic Covenant, Barnabas wrote, Indeed, it is ours, for Moses had hardly received it when they forfeited it forever. Additionally, the Christian church did not claim the biblical commandments in a literal sense, but instead, they spiritualized them completely. They perceived the literal as being only a shadow of what was to come, being that their Jesus completed and abolished the law. To continue observing the literal Sabbath, literal circumcision, literal dietary laws, etc., was considered foolishness and nonsense to the Roman and Greek-based philosophers. For example, Tertullian, one of the church fathers, wrote this concerning the Sabbath and circumcision. It follows accordingly that, insofar as the abolition of carnal circumcision and of the old law is demonstrated as having been consummated at its specific times, so also the observance of the Sabbath is demonstrated to have been temporary. In a letter to Diognetus, possibly written by Justin Martyr in the second century, similar statements are made concerning traditional practices of the Israelite faith. As for their scrupulousness about meats, and their superstitions about Sabbath, and their much vaunted circumcision, and their pretentious festivals and new moon observances, all of them too nonsensical to be worth discussing. Moving forward, the Apostolic Fathers continued to issue statements designed to clearly divorce Christianity from anything considered Jewish. The Mosaic Law, including the Feast and the Sabbath, circumcision and Israel's election by Yah, were all considered things of the past. Additionally, in order to gain the acceptance of Rome, the new Gentile-dominated church made it painfully clear that they had nothing in common with the Jewish faith. In the Epistle of Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, to the Magnesians in 115 CE, Christians were warned of the error of looking to the Jews. To profess Jesus Christ while continuing to follow Jewish custom is an absurdity. The Christian faith does not look to the Jews, but the Jews look to Christianity. Eventually, the teaching of the Church Fathers managed to completely invalidate all Jewish customs in the eyes of the Gentile world. At this Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, Christianity finally became the official religion of the Roman state and the concepts and claims of the then theologians were put into place. The separation between Christianity and Judaism became official. Constantine, the emperor of Rome and leader of the church, made this declaration. You should consider not only that the number of churches in these provinces make a majority, but also that it is right to demand what our reason approves and that we should have nothing in common with the Jews. Simply put, Constantine believed that the mere fact that their provinces make a majority was somehow proof that they had a right to demand what their own reasoning approves. In fact, it was this same majority rules ideology that led to the changing of the Sabbath, which the church admits follows the same circular reasoning. For example, in the publication, A Doctrinal Catechism, 3rd Edition, Rev. Stephen Keenan answers to the Sabbath question with this same logic in the following excerpt. 
Question. Have you any other way of proving that the church has the power to institute festivals of precept? Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Rev. Stephen Keenan, A Doctrinal Catechism, 3rd Edition. In fact, the Romans are clear that the scriptures provide no such authority to the church to change the Sabbath, articulated once again by Archbishop James Cardinal Gibbons in his following statements. But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. During the time of the development of the foundations of the Roman Christian Church, it becomes clear that as all things Jewish were completely tossed out, so were the Nazarim, who were labeled as nothing more than Jews by these same early church fathers, and who held so closely to the practices of the nation of Israel, hated by both the non-believing Jews and the Romans at the same time. It was a dangerous time to be considered one of the Nazarim. Mistaken as simply a sect of the Jews, the Nazarim or those who followed the way of Torah and held to the testimony of Yeshua as Messiah, quickly found themselves vilified by nearly everyone at the same time and were held to the same persecutions that were placed on the Jewish people by the Roman state. In the 3rd century CE, Origen wrote, The blood of Jesus falls not only on the Jews of that time, but on all generations of Jews up to the end of the world. In the scriptures, however, Ezekiel 37, 21-22 says, And say unto them, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. In the 5th century CE, Augustine wrote, The true image of the Hebrew is Judas Iscariot, who sells the Lord for silver. The Jew can never understand the scriptures and forever will bear the guilt for the death of Jesus. But Yahusha said, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment I have received from my father. There is much, much more evidence to demonstrate just how much turmoil surrounded those of the faith of Messiah Yeshua in the years following his ascension. Some could argue that this turmoil has never actually ended. Instead, it is only the dominance of the Christian faith as it emerged through the generations that has grown, and the way of the original Nazarene was completely lost to our historic understanding. We must remember what we were told by the Apostle John in the beginning of this video, that it was already apparent at the time of the Apostles that the Antichrist was at work in their midst. Persecution and violence toward the Jews became common due to heavy restrictive measures imposed by the church against the Jewish and Nazarene people. In the three centuries from 300 to 600 CE, a host of rules were passed containing discriminatory laws against the Jews in the Christian Roman Empire. These were summed up in four major rules contained in the laws of Constantine the Great, the laws of Constantinus, the laws of Theodosius II, and the laws of Justinian. According to Robert Wistrick's book titled, Antisemitism, The Longest Hatred, 
Under Emperor Justinian, Roman law was systematized and codified as Corpus Iuris Civilis, or the Justinian Code. Church law and doctrine now became state policy. The total of these laws declared that Jews were no longer allowed to hold high offices or have military careers. It became a capital offense to convert to Judaism, and intermarriage between Christians and Jews was punishable by death. The Torah was forbidden to be read exclusively in Hebrew, and Jews were allowed only a prescribed version of scripture in their synagogues, and were also prohibited to use prayers that were seen as anti-Trinitarian. The keeping of the Sabbath, Jewish festivals, and performing circumcision were banned, and Jewish property was confiscated. Rabbinical jurisdiction was curtailed. All former religious and governing privileges were removed, and Jews were not permitted to testify against Christians. With the Christianization of the Roman Empire in East and West throughout the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries, the increase in anti-Jewish legislation and teaching reduced Judaism to a position of permanent legal inferiority. In all respects, the Jew had to remain subservient to the Christian, and Christianity soon began to enjoy a position of superiority over Judaism, which caused serious consequences for the Jews. We also know that during this time, what was bad for anyone labeled as a Jew became bad for anyone said to be keeping Jewish practices, such as the Nazarene, regardless if the practices were actually founded in biblical truth. Once something was labeled Jewish, such as the Torah, the feasts, and the Saturday Sabbath, it became stigmatized as evil, and in some cases, even illegal. Essentially, in the midst of all this anti-Jewish rhetoric, the Roman state and its associated church became the enemies of Yah's perfect, holy, and good instructions for righteousness. We can see how the original followers of the Way were swept in among those early Jewish people and were opposed by those who had a fierce vitriol for any practices considered to be Jewish in nature, including the Mosaic Law. But what you may not know is just how significantly prophetic the Nazarene were and still are, as the scriptures outline a beautiful mystery regarding the elect of the end times through this incredible name, the name of Nazarene. You see, the followers of Messiah were first called Christians in Antioch in approximately 50 CE, but that was simply a label handed to them by those outside Gentiles who were observing the early Greek and Roman church plans, such as the self-proclaimed Bishop Ignatius. Before that time, however, this group of people who followed the way of Messiah and kept his commandments were known as the Nazarenes, or more appropriately, the Netzarim. In fact, in the Middle East the word was pronounced as Nozari, which was a diminutive description form of the word Christian. But where does this word truly come from? It was already mentioned before how we can see clearly that this sect was named and known within our own New Testament, such as in Acts 24, 5, which says, For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Yahudim throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Netzarim. But where does this name stem from, and how can we see it in prophecy? In Hebrew, Every single word may be considered as derived from a verbal root of three letters. All words based on the same three letters in the same order are assumed to have a similar internal meaning. The root N-T-S-R is that from which the word Notsri is derived, allegedly in honor of Nazareth or Nazareth in modern speech, which was considered the hometown of Yahusha. It was suggested that Natsri had previously been the name for a type of religious practice, perhaps even derivable from the Lost Ten Tribes. The words Nazari, Nazareth, Nazarini, Nazarene, and so on, although translated differently, are all based on the same Semitic N-T-S-R root word. In the Hebrew written Tanakh, or Old Testament if you prefer, we see various derivatives of this word applied to many passages, such as Strong's 5336, Natsir, 
which means the preserved ones, or Strong's 5341, Natsar, which means the guardians. For example, if we look more closely at some of the prophetic scriptures referring to the elect of the end times, such as Isaiah 49.6, we start to see some very interesting clues as to who the Nazarim really are. Raise up the tribes of Jacob and the preserved of Israel to return, for I have given you as a light unto the Gentiles for my salvation to reach unto the ends of the earth. The word for the preserved here in the Hebrew is Strong's 5336, Natsir, which means the preserved ones. So quite literally, this verse could read, Raise up the tribes of Jacob and the Natsiri of Israel to return. For I have given you as a light unto the Gentiles for my salvation to reach unto the ends of the earth. Incredible. The word Natsiri, which is translated in the KJV as the preserved, also holds some other fascinating insights. The word also connotes the enclosed or locked away. Often it is also translated as guardian or watchman as well. But even more fascinating, the derivative of this word is also connected to the word branch. For example, Isaiah 11.1, 1, another vastly prophetic scripture, tells us the following. A rod will come forth from Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Amazingly, it just so happens that the word for branch here is Strong's 5342, Netzer, and again derives from Strong's 5341, Natsar. So again, quite literally, this verse could also read, A rod will come forth from Jesse, and a Natsar shall grow out of his roots. Is this verse a prophetic tie to not only our Messiah, but the branches that are the body of Messiah as well? Remember the words of Yahusha HaMashiach in John 15, verse 5 through 8, when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Since we know that our Messiah spoke in Aramaic, Hebrew, could it be possible that he literally said, I am the vine, ye are the Natsari? He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing? Here's another example from prophecy in Isaiah 14:19, where the Natsarim are again compared to branches. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Again, here we have use of the word Netzer to refer to the branches, Strong's 5342. Isaiah 60.21 tells us that the Nazarim shall be righteous and inherit the land. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Replace branch with the Hebrew root word, Strong's 5342, and you get the following passage. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the Natsar of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Could it be that both the Old Testament and New Testament references to branches all throughout the scripture were meant to point to the Natsarim? Although the word branch is not always translated from the Hebrew word Natsar, I believe we can still see some pretty prophetic connections from the previous verses to the following ones, such as Isaiah 4.2, which says, In that day shall the branch of Yahuwah be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are the escaped of Israel. But we also must remember that the root of Natsar as mentioned has additional connotations of preservation 
and to watch or guard, both of which are occupied with the concept of preserving or to be the preserved. For example, in Jeremiah 31 6, most major commentators agree that those spoken of in this passage are the exiled of Israel, or the scattered ten tribes of Israel, here referred to as the Nazrim, or watchmen upon the Mount of Ephraim. If you've already viewed our video, The Identity Crisis, Finding the Lost Sheep of Israel, you're already familiar with the concept that we of the faith are grafted into the house of Israel through Ephraim, and that we are the scattered among the nations that is so often referred to in prophetic scriptures. If you missed that study, make sure you check it out as soon as you can. In the meantime, let's take a look at Jeremiah 31 6 according to the Sefer translation. For there shall be a day that the Nazarim upon Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion, unto El Yahuwah Elohainu. Again, the KJV translates this word to watchman, saying, For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount of Ephraim shall cry. However, once again, when we look to the Hebrew for this word, the Sefer translation has it spot on. Strong's 5341, Nozarim. And just one more proof text demonstrating how the Nazarim are the guardians, the watchmen, or the preserved ones comes from Jeremiah 4.16. The KJV reads the following. Make ye mention to the nations, Behold, publish against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country, and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field, are they against her round about, because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. Watchers, Strong's 5341. Once again, the Nazarim. Perhaps this is why the Sefer edition of the scriptures translated this verse as the following. Make ye mention to the nations, Behold, publish against Yerushalayim, that Nazarim come from a far country, and give out their voice against the cities of Yehuda. So it should be becoming quite clear now that the Nazarim, both of the Old Testament or Tanakh, and in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, were spoken of openly in the original Hebrew and Greek languages. First, the prophecies calling the Nazarim the watchmen, the guardians, the preserved ones, and even the branches. Then, in the New Testament, they are called the sect of the Nazarenes, a sect which was known to be spoken against everywhere. The name of Christian was a name that was used by outsiders, by Gentiles, to refer to the church that was being built in Antioch, or the church that was being built within the influence of Greek and Roman philosophy. Ultimately, this would become the church that made up the official Roman state religion in 381 CE, as we discussed. We can also see and understand now that these same philosophers along with their Roman and Greek counterparts and influences, were harshly antagonistic toward not only the Jewish people, but also the Nazarim, who were generally lumped in among them. But there's still great hope for the name and future of these prophetic people, the Nazarim, those who kept faith in the Messiah Yeshua and also held to his beautiful instructions for righteousness, as we can see clearly in prophetic texts that these same people will one day cry out on the Mount of Ephraim. They will be the watchmen on the wall. They will be the branches of Yah's own planting. They will be heirs to Zion. My friends, if you hold to the testimony of Yahusha HaMashiach, our Messiah, and walk in the path of righteousness as laid out by His Torah, you are the Nazarim of the end times, grafted into the commonwealth of Israel through Ephraim, a light to the nations, otherwise known as the Gentiles. Remember what Ecclesiastes 1.9 told us when it said, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun.
We, the Nazarim, have already been called back to the ancient path, the path of the first disciples, the path of Yahusha himself, just as it was prophesied in many of Yah's own words, in Jeremiah, in Hosea, in Jubilees, and many more. And now, the last time is already at hand, just as the apostles have told us. Have there not been enough signs of the age? The Revelation 12 sign, the Great American Eclipse, the Tetrad Blood Moons, the rise of global religion, the uniting of world powers, the birth pangs of the earth itself, the development of artificial intelligence, microchip implants, the sudden rise of demonic and paranormal activity, and much, much more. We know that according to our own apostles, the Antichrist was already at work all the way back before the destruction of Jerusalem. And this video may have given you some clues as to what and who those Antichrist statements were truly pointed at. However, we must not fear anything but Yah Himself, for although there exist many prophecies concerning the destruction to come, we must remember the blessings and protection that comes with walking in righteousness. It is called the breastplate of righteousness for a reason, after all. Thank you for joining us on this study of our prophetic name, the Nazarene. Our prayer is that it will serve as a blessing to you and an encouragement to the lost sheep of Israel, now found by our great shepherd, Yahusha HaMashiach. If this video was a blessing to you, make sure you give us an Amen in the comments section and share across your social platforms. If you haven't already, subscribe and click the bell to be notified the next time we post. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Blessings and Shalom.